that are here this morning. Uh, I need to just speak with you real quick after the morning service. Uh, it should take but five minutes. Uh, we're going to continue our uh, study this morning on membership. Uh, we uh, started last week and got through a good bit. Uh, I'm hoping to, to get through all I've got plan to this morning, but if not, we'll put it off for the next section uh, or session. Uh, I, I gave out some sheets. Those are just informational sheets. They're not going to be a test at the end of it. Uh, I had Donna scared, I think, a little bit, <laughs> but no no test uh, on it this, this morning. Uh, but uh, uh, I, I do want to try to get through as much of this this morning as possible. Because uh, next week, I, I think what we'll do uh, is just do the regular Sunday school class since we're not having an evening service. I want to get the Sunday school lesson in. Uh, so we'll, we'll go back to the Sunday school lesson next Sunday and then continue after, uh, after Easter uh, with the, the membership class. Uh, and so we can you know, keep on schedule at least with our Sunday school lessons. Uh, hopefully, we, the, that uh, these can be wrapped up in a couple more uh, sessions after this. If not, maybe it'll take an extra one, but I hope no more than three more sessions. All right, well, I put a lot of this new together uh, yesterday, and so I hope to have it in an order that uh, is very understandable. Uh, we're going to get into where we came from uh, this this morning as as we begin this session, uh, and and more specifically the Blenner Hassett Church to begin with. Uh, how many of you know when this church was established or when it was first started its services? Anybody? 1946. It first started its uh, services. Uh, under uh, Pastor Re or Reverend D. M. Province, is that how you say it? it, it Province. Uh, it actually was established in 19, uh, 1949. It did start, however, having services, the way I understand, in 1946. Uh, the history that I've got on it, uh, the church was built then uh, by Reverend Province. Property was donated by the Rhodes family. It began as a basement, so underneath of us was a, the old basement, I guess. I can re I visited with Wanda uh, a while back, and uh, she was telling me how uh, she can remember going into the basement uh, of the church. Anyhow, the basement was filled in, and the new church built on top of it, and it extended into or onto the next door paint store. Oh, is it? What's this paint store? Yeah, okay. Anyhow, uh, Reverend Province worked at the Nabisco Company, lived in Camden Avenue, and each evening after work, he and his family walked to the church uh, to continue the physical building of the, of the church. This church was known as Third Church of the Nazarene. Uh, so I guess First Church was First Church, probably Broadway was Second Church, and then this was probably Third Church. And, and then he he uh, he was here until 1951 when Reverend Carl Nutter came. Uh, he was here till 53. Carl Nutter, it says, was a fiery preacher. He was known for running, shouting, and strong belief in healing. During his time of pastor, his son's kidneys were healed. Uh, he started a radio station, WCEF, in the basement of the church. The program was called the Little White Church. So... Uh, that's something that he did. There's not much information on the next pastor, Reverend uh, A. George Pitzer. Uh, he was here from 53 to 55. And then Reverend Grant, he was here from 55 to 57. And all I've got on him is that the church continued to grow under the ministry of Reverend Grant. I, I do know from just talking to him the other day, uh, his first wife, I think, did she pass away during his ministry here? So, so that was probably a hardship on 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 both the church and him. And then in 1957, uh, Reverend William Dillion, 
uh, till 58, no information on him. Then 58 and 59 was Reverend Wilbur Beaver. No information available on either of those two. Any Anyone know much about them? Or Okay. And then 59, probably one of the longest extended uh, ministries, uh, almost 20 years, uh, 59 to 77, Reverend E.W. Keezer, I think is how you say his name, known best known as the best years of the church. The church attendance was 110 plus. Reverend Keezer spoke with a lisp, but when he started preaching, no one had trouble understanding him. Uh, Reverend Keezer was known to jump over the altar and, and for kicking up his left leg when he was happy in the Lord. Lots of people were saved under his ministry. In every service, there was a singing, shouting, and running down the aisles. In 1972, the Third Church of the Nazarene was renamed Martown Church of the Nazarene. Anyone attended during those years? Were you all here then? So you, you knew Reverend Keezer? Yeah. I don't, I don't remember the name. And then David Lewis, Reverend David Lewis from 77 to 84. Uh, Reverend Lewis was known as an encourager and one of the greatest visiting pastors of the church. Then Brother Johnson, Roy, Lloyd Johnson, Reverend Lloyd Johnson, 84 to 91. It says many people were saved and healed under Reverend Johnson's ministry. He started uh, the Thursday morning prayer meetings, which was one of the highlights of the church. We knew Reverend Johnson quite well and really enjoyed his preaching and, and loved it when he got blessed. All right, 91 to 95 was Reverend John Barker. I knew him some. Uh, it was under Reverend Barker's ministry that property was purchased at Davisville uh, to be used as a, as a parsonage. I didn't know that. And then 95 to 2002, Reverend Jesse Keenan, uh, parking lot was paved and Parsonage uh, remodeled during the ministry of Reverend Keenan. Uh, he took in many members during his or during this time. The back back to school bash was started, and many book bags were given away each year. And then, of course, Bob Niley, Reverend Niley, uh, 2002 to 2017. In 2003, the ch name was changed from Martown to Blinner Hassett Church of the Nazarene. Now I know who to blame. Anyhow, <laughs> uh, I hate writing that word out. I mean, uh, somebody asked me how to spell it. I can't spell it unless I write it down. So anyhow, the dedication of the new church, and I guess this was supposed to be annex, but in the, in the, in the writing it was A-I-M-E-X. That's not a word, but should be annexed. Anyhow, uh, dedicated that annex in, in uh, May of 15th of 2005. The annex consisted of the pastor's office, seven classrooms, nursery, closed circuit TV was installed to allow uh, workers to view the service, profits, quarters, kitchen, and bathrooms. Uh, the property at Davisville was sold and funds were used to help uh, build the addition. In 2006, the sanctuary was totally remodeled and and the dedication was held May 14, 2006. The first baptistry was installed at that time. Later, the property adjacent to the church was purchased and is current, currently used as a rental property until such a time as needed for a parsonage. Now, during Reverend Niley's ministry, the women's ministry, men's ministry, Tuesday morning intercessory prayer meeting, caravan, Pinewood Derbies, and other ministries were started. And then, of course, myself came on in 2018. So that's a little bit of a background of where we came from as a local church, Blair Hassan Church of the Nazarene. But what about the story of the Church of the Nazarene? Um, let me let me just read some uh, some things to you uh, from from the student book and whatnot. Uh, it says here. During a general assembly, the meeting every four years of the representatives and interested members from Nazarene churches around the world. That's where every four years they come together. It says the streets of Kansas City were overrun with thousands of Nazarenes. They, were fi they filled the hotels and restaurants and city sidewalks. Their enthusiasm, excitement, and close-knit family feelings identified them. In the midst of this enormous gathering, a man who had no connection with the church sat in the shoeshiner parlor looking in disbelief 
in disbelief at this great group of people and said, Who are the Nazarenes? Well, the man shining his shoes answered directly with the, without hesitation. Well, they're sort of uh, souped up Methodist. <laughs> uh, he goes on, the, 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 it is true that the Church of the Nazarene is rooted in the teachings of John Wesley, who was the founder of Methodism. You and I talked a little bit about this, Mike. Uh, but it is not true that the Church of the Nazarene is a split from the Methodist Church. The early church, the early leaders came from many denominations. Okay, so when we formed them, we'll get into that uh, a, a little bit after uh, here in a little while. Uh, but that's who that's who we were, and and we we were really uh, it was after in in the aftermath of the Civil War, there was a spiritual awakening that infiltrated. Uh, America I mean it was one of the great awakenings and the result was that people dying to themselves and letting God uh, have complete control of their lives it was it was something that that just totally took over their lives uh, by the turn of the centuries century Tens of thousands of people had found this gift of heart purity and and uh, perfect love. I, I mean, just in a you know a few years of the, after the the the, the, the Civil War, uh, this this was taking place. Uh, as a result of that revival, denominations uh, grew. Uh, and, and expanded new colleges, Bible schools, and 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 training uh, centers were built. Uh, several new uh, denominations emerged. Most uh, notable, of course, was the uh, Wesleyan Holiness, Holiness denomination in the Church of of, of the Nazarene. Uh, during those years. Uh, Significant groups throughout the United States were discovering the biblical truth that a Christian can be cleansed and filled with the Spirit of God. And, and they, they learned that God's Holy Spirit can bring us perfect love. Uh, these groups found a spirit of unity among themselves, joined together and, and formed the Church of the Nazarene. The Holy Spirit of God, the Spirit of God was moving. I think of what it says in Genesis, you know, the, the Spirit of God hovered over the earth. And, and, and you know, this, we've never been without the Spirit. The Spirit is part of the Trinity and has been here, you know, I mean, as, as God has. Anyhow, during these years surrounding the turn of the century, many people in different parts of the nation formed churches that were uh, called to share that good news of heart cleansing and a life of holiness. Okay, so you've got all these little holiness churches popping up all over the over the country. In fact, in New England, uh, uh, ten different congregations who shared the message of entire sanctification came together to form a union on March 13th and 14th, 1890, with the Reverend W. C. Ryder was being elected the leader or the president of that group okay so you got this group of new england that they came together over 10 churches and then in new york city now i, I want you to think about this for a moment I, I thought about this as i was preparing this these are some of the prominent cities and, and states new england in america and you, you'll see as we go on but there's something ironic about it, and I want you to think about that for a moment. Anyhow, uh, in New York City, uh, on November 12th, 1896, this group from New England joined forces with a group from Brooklyn, New York, led by Reverend William Howard Hoople. Okay, and now, that's, that's the East, okay? And now we've got over here on the West, in Los Angeles, another big city okay 
uh, Reverend Phineas F. Brzee and D.D. and J.P. Whitney uh, formed the First Church of the Nazarene in October of 1895, and within 10 years, there was 26 organized or, uh, churches, congregations in this area. Okay, so in 10 years, they grew to 26 churches. Here you got this group that formed New England and, and New York City that they formed, 10 churches or so there, okay, and, and so they formed. And then you have some some groups from the South in Tennessee in 1894 at Millen, Tennessee, 14 people who found a common experience of entire sanctification came together to form the New Testament Church of Christ. They were led by R.L. Harris, and their influences was felt throughout the western Texas and Arkansas. So they were making a, a big impact as well. And then you've got in, in Texas in 1901 at Van Astle, Alliston, Texas, the Independent Holiness Church was uh, started by Reverend C.B. Jennigan. Within two years, this organization had, re, had created uh, 20 churches. You see it growing? And they're all independent churches, all separated still, okay? They're, 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 not, they're not really coming together until this group, uh, this group uh, from Tennessee and the group from Texas came together in 1904. We're getting closer to the 1908 date, okay? So here we are in 1904. This, these two groups came together to frame a manual and a statement of their beliefs in 1905. These, uh, these two groups formed one group called the Holiness Church of Christ. Unity through God's Spirit from these groups who were diverse parts of the nation. Uh, I mean, you couldn't be any more diverse. Came together uh, to help form the Church of the Nazarene. It was a joining of the, uh, the, the East, West, and North, South. Uh, and now as the group from the East and the group from the West came to be known uh, with each other, the feeling grew that they should unite. And from their conference, a statement was developed and unanimously, unanimously adopted that expressed the real purpose of the church. And here's that statement. It is agreed that the two churches are on, on in the doctrines considered essential to salvation, especially the doctrine of justification by faith and entire sanctification, subsequent to justification also by faith. And as a result, the precious experience of entire sanctification as a normal condition of the churches. Both churches recognize the right of church membership rests upon experience that the persons who have been born of the Spirit are entitled to its privileges. So being a member is still a privilege. Uh, we, we agree to certain things and... and, and, and Certain offices can only be held, and if you're your member, and so so it was important, and it started clear back in 1904, uh, and then the first assembly of the two churches was actually held of these two churches was held in Chicago in 1907. At that assembly, several representatives from the group in Tennessee and Texas accepted an invitation to to come and be a part of that assembly. Um, a year later, that assembly was held in Pilot Point, Texas, at the in, uh, at the invitation of the Southern group, the Texas and the and the, and the uh, uh, Tennessee group. It was an amazing turn of events and an uh, and a, an even more amazing turn of hearts that caused people from east, west, north, south to lay aside their differences so that God's kingdom could advance. I think it's so important. The only way God's kingdom is, is going to continue to grow is if God's people set aside their different... I mean, we all have different thoughts and ideas and things of that nature, but we've got to set that aside and put God first. R.B. Mitchum moved in that meeting that the union of the two churches be now consummated. And so on, on October 13th, 
it was a Tuesday in 1908 the Church of the Nazarene was officially formed as the group from the east and the group from the west and the group from the south came together came together uh, at the central th thrust of the great revival that we were talking about was the fullness of God's powerful love this is from the book it says Dwight L. Moody Any, anyone ever heard of that name? Moody Institute Okay, Dwight L. Moody heard a young man preach for six nights in a row on John 3.16. Six nights in a row. Moody's reaction was, I never knew up to that time that God loved us so much. This heart of mine began to, began to thaw out. I knew I could not keep back the tears. I was like news, or it was like news from a far country I just drank it in the nation was drinking in the perfect love of God evangelist Moody while holding a meeting in Chicago in 1871 was approached by two godly women who announced that they were praying for him <laughs> Moody exclaimed why don't you pray for the people I'm all right well to that they answered this you are not all right. Wow. <laughs> Woo. <laughs> okay. Uh, you do not have power. Moody was upset at first, but in time he began to desire the powerful love these women were praying for. Later he gave this testimony. They continue to pray for me. The result was that at the end of three months, God sent this blessing upon me and I could not for the world go back to where I was before 1871 heart cleansing heart purity Charles Finney another well known uh, church father whose meetings were meetings and messages were known across the United States tells us of his experience no words can express the wonderful love that was shed abroad in my heart. I wept aloud with joy. The ancient truth of the, Bib of the Bible was coming to light in our own country. Christians can truly be holy, happy, victorious, love-filled children of God. And so all these groups with that experience of heart holiness came together and formed the Church of the Nazarene in that period of time. Uh, and, and so uh, we, we see a little bit there about how the Church of the Nazarene was born or by, by great, great people. Uh, another story I want to share with you here. Uh, other groups, okay, so you have the, the, the coming together in Pilot Point, Texas. Other groups came to join the, this young denomination. Reverend J.O. McClurkin headed a group of very, group of very missionary-minded people who also shared the same beliefs as the Nazarenes. In 1915, this group and their mission work joined a church. At the same time, a group of churches in the British Isles under the leadership of Reverend George Sharp also became part of the Church of the Nazarene. Seven years later, the Layman's Holiness Association of more than a thousand members under the leadership of their president, Reverend J.G. Morrison, united with the Church of the Nazarene, bringing their extensive program of evangelism and camp meeting. It is this same spirit of unity that still welcomes people from all over the world into the family of the church of the Nazarene. Last week we talked about what makes a great church. We talked about, you know, big churches and, and missionary-minded churches and so forth. You can see the diverse type of ministry, but the same message, heart holiness. Heart holiness. And so 
the church of the Nazarene was born in the spirit of uh, of great people. Uh, you know, God moves through the sweeping work of His Holy Spirit after this national revival and and awakening that took place. He, he moves in a great way. Uh, and then He also was able to do that because through the unity of His people who set aside their prejudices to be joined for His purpose. We didn't have communications back then like we got today so you think about how this had to grow it god's spirit had to be moving we talk about email well it back then it was email okay uh god house however god also moved through individuals who were wholly committed not only through not only through the groups of people but through individuals who were holy w-h-o-l-l-y wholly committed to him in the things that mattered. Uh, and the story of the Church of the Nazarene uh, contains the story of many great men and women of God. Uh, just a few of them. And, and maybe you know some of the names and maybe you don't, but these are some of the great leaders of our, our denomination. Uh, F.A. Uh, Hillary uh, was, was one of them. Uh, W.C. Ryder uh, William Howard Hoople, which we mentioned there earlier. H.F. Reynolds. Uh, how many of you know this name? Uncle Buddy Robinson. Uh, he, you talk about somebody who had a, a, a hisp in, in his, his it, and it went completely away when he preached. C.W. Ruth, Reverend Mary Lee uh, Cagle, uh, J.B. Uh, Jernigan, uh, J.G. Morrison. H.O. Wiley, J.B. Chapman, him and Louise Chapman. I talk to you about Louise Chapman quite often about the experience where she had set up her little sanctuary out out in the field and and how how uh, how God moved and and spoke to her out there in that little sanctuary of hers. R.T. Williams, uh, Ferry Chisholm, E.P. Ellison, and 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 others. And, and then of course you got Dr. Phineas F. Brzee. Uh, Dr. Phineas F. Brzee, I got to share this with you and, and bear with me. It's a little lengthy, but it's out of your book, and 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 yet it's it's something that we need to. We've seen the movie, right? I mean, you really enjoyed the movie, right? Well, this fills in a little bit of the details. The following is one of uh, one story of many. It is the story of Dr. Phineas F. Brzee, one of the first general superintendents of the Church of the Nazarene, along with E.P. Ellison and H.F. Reynolds. And it is one story that d demonstrates that what God was doing across the nation at the time of the Church of the Nazarene was born. In the beginning, Phineas F. Brzee was born in the log cabin in Franklin, New York. On New, York e on New Year's Eve in 1838, he was converted in uh, he was converted in February of 1856. When the family moved to Iowa, the, this young man was, of 19 received a preacher's license. In 1861, he was ordained as an elder in the Methodist Church. As a circuit rider, the young preacher was first embittered and then challenged to uh, by his assignments. He said, "It should go, live or die." it should go. At the end of the first year, he had received 140 people into membership and purchased a comfortable parsonage as well as a fine buggy with a team of horses to take him uh, on to the conferences. As was custom of the day, he moved to several churches, some for more than one term. In these early years, he developed two ideas that stayed with him all, his, all of his life. He used the custom of singing popular choruses in the song services. Think about that. Back then, he was breaking ground, okay? Uh, going against a little bit against the tradition and, and singing song or choruses for songs. He also reached the conviction that a large and beautiful building was unnecessary uh, to any successful gospel work. This building's nice. But he says it's unnecessary for the, the advancement of the gospel. And then 
in the winter of 1866 and 67, this is this this you probably d didn't know, was the beginning of a long search by Phineas Brzee. He writes this, quote, it seemed as though I doubted everything, unquote. At a prayer meeting on a snowy night from the altar of his own church, he prayed the Lord would give him what he needed. He experienced the infilling presence of God's perfect love. Yet, his deeper relationship with God was to leave him for a time. Heart, that, that closeness that he experienced got cold. Other things grew out of proper proportion. Perhaps the major reason the experience of perfect love was lost was because of Brzee's involvement in an ill-fated gold mining venture in New Mexico. You remember that in the video. He became involved with Reverend Joseph Knotts, a former pastor turned spec speculator. Er, sp no, one of the guys that goes looking for gold prospector but it calls him speculator so anyhow in the gold mining business in 1879 Brzee took a rather insignificant church so that he might have more time to work on these enterprises so he got his focus off of the things of God and onto the things of the world he even sold shares in the mine to his church members if you remember that happening in the movie and soon after this there was a blast set off in the mine and all the tools and machinery were destroyed. Brzee was in financial ruin and disgrace. He learned his lesson, however. He, he determined that he would give the remainder of his life to the direct preaching of the word of God. His friend Knotts gave him $1,000 and in 1883, at age of 44, Brzee and his family of seven children and two grandparents boarded an immigrant railway car for California. The family arrived in Los Angeles the following Sunday. Brzee was invited to preach at the First Methodist Church. He was installed uh, as pastor within two weeks. He, he, then he encountered people of this in this fine church who understood the concept of allowing God to fill the Christian with his Holy Spirit and perfect love. He writes, I instinctively in spirit allied myself with them. Two men, McDonald and Watson, leading evangelists in the National Holiness Association, conducted special services at the church for three weeks, three weeks in 1884. It was in these services that Brzee settled once and for all the question of his complete commitment to the cleansing love of Jesus Christ. It was, pu it was uh, purity and power combined. Rarely does he tell about the experience, but on one occasion he put it down in these words, quote, There came into my heart and being a transformation or transformed condition of life and blessing and unction and glory, which I never known before. I felt that my need was supplied. From that point on in his ministry, or his ministry expanded greatly. Two years later, when he left the church at Los Angeles, the congregation had 650 members, four times that of any other Southern uh, California church. And they had well over a thousand for every Sunday morning worship service. Mega church back in 1884. In 1886, August, Brzee accepted an appointment in Pasadena, a little known in a little known town in the foothills of the San Gabriel Mountains. <coughs> the church had only 130 members. Brzee say, by the grace of God, I'm going to make a fire that will reach heaven. By the end of the first year, the membership uh, more than doubled. During the next six months, 250 members joined <coughs> the church. They now had to build a tabernacle that would seat 2,000 people. <coughs> Can you give me a drink of water? Uh, the number of members stood by 700 at the end of the second year. In 1891, Brzee was appointed presiding elder of the Los Angeles district. He stepped out to conduct the two-year campaign with meeting the, uh, in every church in the area. 
All the churches quickly accepted this call, except one, the Simpson Church in Los Angeles. They did not like the man, his message, or his methods. These meetings across the city and throughout Southern California produced great growth, excitement, enthusiasm in all the churches. In 1892, General Conference was, was talk of making Phineas Brzee a bishop. Upon returning to Southern California, John H. Vincent was presiding was the presiding was presiding as bishop. He was dead set against the concept of heart purity and perfect love that Dr. Brzee was pre preaching. He removed Dr. Brzee from his office and appointed him as pastor of the Simpson Church. The church had a seating capacity of 2,500 people and fi finer acoustical arrangements than any theater or opera house in the state. However, it was cold and dead. The coming of Dr. Brzee, the man that didn't like to be, they didn't like to begin with, only strengthened their negativism. Within a year, they had to sell the building and close the church in order to get out of debt. Dr. Brzee spent much of, this, of his time holding camp meetings, meeting services in other districts. Also, he became involved in supporting a recently founded University of Southern California, USC. These great cities are not so conservative anymore. That's what I was thinking about earlier. New England, one of the most liberal states there is. New York City, Los Angeles, Texas, they're, they're still conservative. Tennessee, I'm not sure about. But think about some of these big cities. Uh, he he done that in cooperation with J.P. Whitney, uh, M.D., who was uh, to become a great friend. Since the, Dr. Brzee had no church to preach in, he turned in an old dream for inner city mission to poor people. However, he could not get an, an appointment uh, to this position through the Methodist Church. So Dr. Brzee joined the Peniel Mission in 1894. This was a non-denominational mission which he worked without an appointment. He would hold a Tuesday prayer meeting, Sunday school, and Friday night young people's meetings. In 1895, when he and his friend Whitney made a journey to the Midwest to hold meetings and study the various missions of, the, of, of Chicago, the people of Peniel Missions were holding secret meetings against them. The men returned to find they were frozen out. At the age of 56, he was without a church, without a pulpit, or a place to minister. <coughs> Dr. Whitney and Dr. Brzee began a new church on Sunday, October 6, 1895. Dr. Brzee Dr. Brzee's morning text was Thus saith the Lord Stand ye in the ways and see And as for the old paths Where is the good way And walk therein And ye shall find rest for your soul Jeremiah 6.16 6, Two weeks later 82 persons united as charter members Of the Church of the Nazarene Within a short time That number had grown to 135 most of these were new converts. It was Dr. Whitney who explained the name of the church. He said this, and I quote, The word Nazarene depicts the toiling, lowly ministry of Christ. It was this, same, it was this name that was used in uh, derision of him and his enemies. It is this name that links him uh, with the struggling, sorrowful, sorrowing hearts of the world. It is Jesus, Jesus of Nazareth, to whom the world in its misery and despair turns, that it may have hope. Unquote. The first piece of literature produced by the church reads, Its mission is to everyone upon whom the battle of life has been sore and every heart that hungers for cleansing from sin. And by the end of the year, the first year, there was 350 members in the church. Within eight years, there were 1,500 members in a, in a swarm of new churches. Four years later, the union that took place at Pilot Point, Texas, set the course for the Church of the Nazarene.
to become a worldwide denomination. Not only did it work through individuals and groups, but they worked through one man specifically, Dr. Brzee, uh, to do things that we really find uh, sometimes a little uh, hard to believe. <clears throat> and then you get into, when we're talking about where we come from, you get into the characteristics of the, the early church. And that is the Church of the Nazarene was born in the Spirit of God. It is interesting to note the lesson where the book says, to note that the early characteristics of the church are the ideas that we are set, that we set for our church today. The church's early history is recorded by Dr. Timothy L. Smith. He outlines the following. Okay. First one is the government of the church was to be thoroughly democratic. It's fully believed that God can work out his will through people who are committed to him in love. Secondly, the chief aim of the church was to preach this message of holiness. That's why we were called out, folks. That's why Dr. Brzee done what he did and others like him. Their message of holiness. A holy God has come to make his people holy by cleansing from sin and filling with perfect love. Sharing this message was and still is the major mission of our church. Third was the discipline in the early church was dependent primarily upon the work of the Holy Spirit. Dr. Brzee uh, always believed that if men and women were filled with God's love, the Holy Spirit could guide them in choosing a life that pleased God. Mike, you mentioned it, I think, last week. At salvation, that moment that God saved me, and you mentioned the same thing, I had a desire to do what he wanted me to do, no longer to be a part of the things of my past. And and, and that's the message of holiness. Uh, the fourth one is the church statement of belief was central and made the concept of God's holy love more important. And and it, what it means by that is the church was to have no new doctrine, just old, old truth. It was not and is not a sect, splintered group, or any other than a vehicle to preach and teach the biblical truth of holy love. I've, I've heard us described as a sect. You know, in, in some of your church history books, they describe the Church of the Nazarene as a sect, as a, as a, as a group or a, 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 a vehicle or a, a, you know, a splitter from, from other people. No, it was a coming together. That's what you, we. That's what we got to understand. It was God moving these groups of people and coming together. And and lastly, the church was characterized by a spirit that was uh, joyously free. He goes on to say, whether we are worshiping on Sunday, calling through the week, meeting together, prayer meeting, or joining, uh, just going out about their daily routine, there was a spirit of joyous freedom that was a part of these people. And that is still with us today. Uh, many Nazarenes, for many Mazar Nazarenes, Dr. Brzee's character characterizes the Church of the Nazarene. His pulpit delivery and conversation speaking to, to each one as if they were the only person uh, that uh, present. Regardless of the time of day, he always greeted people with good morning. It was a positive message. He even re refused to to park his buggy where he would have to pick, have to back up. He wanted to always be moving ahead. Think about that. He would never park it where he had to back his buggy up. On Friday, October 8, 1915, Dr. Brzee attended his last general assembly. He was given, he was again elected general superintendent. They presented him with 77 roses, one for each year of his life, and one additional white rose for the year ahead. This rose was prophetic. 29 days after the assembly, his life work was finished. His final formal message written to his church was Matthew 5, 44 through 45. Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be, uh, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. So there you have a little bit about what we can't, where we came from. The church 
folks is people it's not a building it's people God used these people uh, it, is a, it is an attitude of joy faithfulness and prayer and, and enthusiasm of its members that makes the church what it is uh, we talked about you know looking forward to, to coming to church on Sundays and, and so forth and the church needs prayer needs your prayers needs needs our prayers uh, it needs your, your faithfulness without the faithfulness of God's people there is no church and it also needs our enthusiasm and, and so uh, without any of that we we can't be the church that God wants us to be uh, I want to get started on this next session here real quick uh, about what we believe uh, I don't know how I, we probably won't get through it all we've only got about 10 minutes I don't want to uh, push it and and not get a lot of what we're going to get into in this section because this is an important section <clears throat> it's good to know your roots amen good to know what where you came from why you was formed what happened and how God moved uh, not only as a as an individual but as a, as a group of, of people but what we believe uh, I, I, I told you my, my personal testimony I shared it a little bit last week about being underneath the pine tree and praying that prayer God give me the family that I don't have and I'll, I'll give you my life and I got away from God for, after those Sunday school years in my early years and, and uh, didn't think much of it until probably maybe freshman in high school and uh, I started going to church because I got cut from the high school <clears throat> basketball team, but I wanted to play basketball. So I, there was a church league. I got in the church league, and that plus uh, there was a girl that I liked that was going to this church. So it 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 fit. It wasn't this girl here, but she was later on. But it fit, and so I started going to church again. Didn't make any kind of a commitment to 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 it. Was there just to play basketball? There to to see the girl that I liked and and then uh, got away from from that altogether attended church as I told you about you know moving to Ohio and so forth and so on and coming back to West Virginia and then finally meeting Christina uh, but it was it was early 90s when when I was we was getting back into church and I was going to Fairmont first traveling back and forth to, to Parkersburg or Williamstown on the weekends uh, or during the week I would be down at the airfield and, and on the weekends I'd come home and we'd go to church uh, at Fairmont first and God started speaking to my heart again and, uh, I don't remember uh, what the message was about uh, but I, I can remember sitting over here probably about where Randy was or so and and getting up and going to the altar uh, and and just giving my heart to the Lord again and it was an experience it wasn't just a prayer it was God's spirit witness to my spirit that he had done a work in me and I knew I was different I knew something happened and I didn't hold no whole lot about church and the things of church Taught, we know we're going to get into some don't let words get in the way here later on but uh, I didn't understand the language of church uh, but I started attending church regularly then Chrissy wasn't a Christian then we got back into Williamstown uh, was visited by we moved to Williamstown then was visited by Reverend Hayes and his family and we started going to the Vienna church and got into the ministry there or the, the work of the church there and I don't remember if it was Guy Wright or Reverend Vernon Chips but uh, I had been reading the book Perfect Love by J.A. Wood and it talked about heart holiness and, and perfect love uh, I mean that's the name of the per book Perfect Love by <laughs> J.A. Wood and I started burning in my heart the scriptures, all the scriptures that that book had. And I was sitting downstairs at our house in Williamstown at the desk there reading. And I was reading 
and I said, oh, man, I got to show Chrissy this. I got to let her see this. I, I mean, and I got up from that chair, turned around, and started to go up the stairs. And before I even got close to the stairs, I fell on my knees. I couldn't get my breath. That's how overcome I was by God's Spirit. There's no mind, doubt in my mind that at that moment, God sanctified my heart. Because he, I was, I've been reading and studying this. But if you, it's a great book. And uh, but I, I done a public going to the altar as well. I think that's important to make a public statement of what God does in our lives. And uh, I went to revival that night and made a public statement. Uh, as we heard, Doctor Brzee, he got got cold that happened in your pastor's life uh, I regret it it's something that haunts me still to this day at times but I can believe what the scripture says this is the will of God but if you do sin you have an advocate with the father is Christ Jesus the righteous need to propitiate anyhow I had to rededicate my life and, and get the fire back. Uh, but that's my personal testimony. Of course, I got called into the ministry shortly after that and started my schooling down at Charleston. Uh, it was a Bible school extension from Colorado Springs. Uh, was got my, got my classes for ordination. I don't even know what year I was ordained, to be honest with you, but I, I do know that I started... Uh, pulpit supply back in 1999 and then have been pastoring in one way or another since then uh, I just want to say God is great uh, he's good uh, I could not have I could not be sitting here today if I didn't have those experiences of kneeling at that altar at Fairmont First of what happened when I got out of my seat in my basement or the day that God called me and I was talking to somebody I think it was Roger just the other day said three words to me just like you're talking to me now I heard God said it is time and we had been talking about it and you know I've been thinking about it you know the, you know is this what God wants for me? Is this what God wants? And at that time, that meant to me, it's time to get your education. It's time to get to the next step. I just fell at the altar and began weeping. It was a call. And if it wasn't for those three things in my life, I wouldn't be sitting here today because it's been a difficult road at times. It's not always easy and and yet God has been faithful to the very end and so it works I I'm passionate about membership class I'm passionate about the things of the Church of the Nazarene and its teachings because I've experienced it I may not have always lived it but I've experienced it I know it's real and when something's real, no one can tell you it's not. No one can take that away from you. They can't take an experience away from you. Uh, Randy, you can relate now to people who have had their knees replaced. Why? Because you are experiencing it. Amen? When somebody says something about a knee replacement, Randy says, you, you don't have to tell me about the pain and, 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 and what, what it's like. I've experienced it. No one can take an experience away from us. Amen? And, and oh, that ain't painful, Randy. Oh, you're just putting it. No, you know what it's like. Don't tell me the pain. Don't tell me about cancer. Don't tell me that, you know, about hip replacement or Achilles heel being torn. Why? Because we've experienced those things. And when we experience things, uh, nothing, nothing, nothing can stand in our way. And so we're going to leave off there this morning. Uh, <clears throat> I wanted to get further, but it just didn't work out. Uh, 
But I wanted to share those stories with you. I think it's important for us to know where we come from and know know what God is doing in our lives and 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 to see where um, we need to go and continue the mission that Dr. Brzee and other holiness churches around this country had when they first formed in, in Pilot Point, Texas. The next section that we're going to get into about what we believe is that uh, we shouldn't let words get in the way. Uh, I told you there when I first became a Christian, I didn't understand church language but we can't allow words to get in the way. We'll get a little bit about in, into more of that in, in the week uh, after Easter. Uh, any questions or thoughts before we close in prayer? Do you like church history? Uh, do you like to understand where you came from and, and uh, get a, get an idea of those those type of things? I, I enjoy it. I never liked history in school, but I, I enjoy knowing uh, my family background. I enjoy knowing, you know, in the church where, where we come from as well. So if no questions, let's close in a word of prayer. Father, we thank you today for your love, your mercy, your grace. We thank you for the opportunity we have just to get together this morning and, and continue looking into the, the church and its uh, foundation and and, and what it's about, Lord. And we thank you for the church of the Nazarene, God, that you did call us together. That you, you brought us together to bring about a message of a holiness and perfect love, Lord, that, that we can have in our hearts and our lives today. And it's only because of you. And, Father, we know that, as Dr. Brzee shared in his testimony and others have experienced, it's a daily commitment. It's a daily dying out to, to the things that this world would have us to do but a, a and then a continuing daily walk with you walking in the light as you are in the light doing the things and seeking out your will each and every day of our lives and having you to to prick our hearts and and to stir our hearts and to understand what it is that we need to do to follow you we love you father we love you this morning we just thank you for your people. I ask that you just be with us through the rest of this, this day. Uh, may the songs and the testimonies and the preaching and everything that's done in the morning worship service bring glory to you. And may you be lifted up that all men may draw nigh to you. We thank you and we praise you in Christ's name. And everyone said, amen, amen. God bless you.